All right, welcome everybody. My name is Laura Craver Rogers, and uh, welcome to Managing Maine's Moose. We are joined here tonight by our moose biologist, Lee Cantar, and he's going to uh, talk to us about some of the work that he does and about the wonderful um, animals called moose. So, Lee, take it away. All right, let's get this uh, rolling here. So, we'll pop up our little presentation on the screen. We'll make that big. Oh, yeah, you can see the can see the big bull moose there. So we got a really nice picture of a moose that's uh, got quite a little bit of velvet retaining on its antlers at the uh, at the end of the summer there. But uh, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about moose biology real quickly here. We'll phase into uh, moose management. And of course, we're going to talk about our arch nemesis, the winter tick and some things that the department's proposing to do to deal with winter ticks. And then at the end of this, uh, I think I'd be very happy to take some questions about moose. And we'll see how we can field those questions and, and answer some things for everybody who's out there. And thank you very much for joining me tonight. Uh, always nice to have a little company and a little uh, excitement and enthusiasm talking about one of our favorite main animals. So, you know, one of the missions of our department is to protect and manage all wildlife species in the state of Maine. And that's everything from small insects like mayflies and things like freshwater mussels to, of course, our favorite critter, the moose. Um, we're also very interested uh, about conserving and working towards promoting Maine's outdoor heritage. And we always wanna make sure that uh, we're doing a good job with outreach and information and education to be able to connect people uh, with the natural world um, through responsible recreation. Um, hopefully all my slides won't be cut off too badly. I had to make some last minute changes here, but you know, all wildlife in the state of Maine are public resources. And of course, all of us, uh, no matter who you are, we have very different and varied opinions and feelings about uh, wildlife. Um, but it is a public resource that we all treasure. And the moose is, of course, unique to us. It's, we have one of the highest density moose populations in the lower 48. And even in this pictures here, a few pictures, you see uh, a couple of young bulls in velvet running across some agricultural fields. Um, there is a little bit of variety as well uh, where moose live in our great state. But, you know, one of the roles of our department, of course, is to balance all the different um, interests and needs. Um, and, you know, moose can get into trouble. Um, you know, over the years, we, we do get collisions with moose. We try to do things um, to help avoid those situations. We work closely with uh, the main department of transportation on trying to lessen the possibility of, of moose in the roadway. Um, you know, moose can impact forests at times with, with the amount of browse. Um, people love to view and see moose and people love to hunt moose. So there, that's a lot of different aspects of uh, moose and management that we have to balance. But, you know, Maine is moose country. People who haven't spent a lot of time in Maine don't even realize that our core habitat, our prime moose habitat covers not only half the state, but really an area that's larger or about as large as New Hampshire and Vermont combined. And we're talking about our really good moose country in the north. There's a really pretty picture here of some moose in a nice, nice, beautiful summer coats uh, looking really nice and healthy there. Um, but yeah, moose uh, in Maine, a lot of great habitat, great place uh, for the most part for moose to be. And in this slide here, I'm showing that area I'm talking about. And these are our wildlife management districts, districts one through 11 and 19, which really comprise this green area on the right, which is all mostly commercial forest lands. And they cut a lot of timber there and uh, Moose like that, moose like young regenerating forests. And uh, that's where they get uh, really good habitat. But 45% of our state 
close to 16,000 square miles, prime moose habitat, nothing, nothing else like that in the Northeast. Of course, why is our state of Maine such a good place for moose? Um, you know, it's, off it's offensive to call moose a big deer, but moose are a member of the so-called deer family, which is comprised of moose, deer, uh, caribou, and elk. All of these animals have the same physical, physiological setup, a four-chambered stomach. Um, you know, moose have that four-chambered stomach where they can take in food fairly quickly and it starts to break down in their gut and then they bring it back up. They essentially regurgitate it and they're able to do it a second time and bring it back down to digest it. Um, so they chew twice. That's always a good thing. Your parents will tell you, chew twice. Be careful how you eat. But can you imagine that a moose that can grow well over a thousand pounds can do that on a vegetarian diet? And in the summertime, a moose is eating, a big moose is eating 30 pounds of vegetation a day. So if you imagine going out in the summertime, hard to imagine right now during spring is just coming on here, but uh, imagine pulling 30 pounds of leaves off trees and stripping trees. That's, that's a lot of bulk per day. But moose are considered generalist browsers. Um, they actually, compared to other members of the deer family, they kind of eat, um, you know, mostly focusing on shrubs. They, they, some people think they eat grasses and little forbs, but that's really a deer thing. They really focus on shrubs and saplings. They can strip trees with their lower teeth, um, but that's what they survive on. And they have narrow muzzles, prehensile lips and a tongue. So they're really adept at getting into really brushy parts of the plant and taking the most nutritious part of these stems. And then that becomes even more important over the winter time. But, you know, being a moose can be very nice as, as, as far as dealing with any potential predators up in Canada, um, you know, where they have wolves and things like that. It's obviously good to be a big moose because uh, you have a lower risk of predation, especially when you compare that to an animal of the size of a deer. Um, our moose calves in Maine, by the time uh, December rolls around, and uh, these animals are seven, eight, seven, eight months old, they're already 400 pounds for, for a moose calf. Um, so it, it's really good to be big and it's good to be big and large in a climate that is, can be very cold in the winter time. Uh, and you can take in and retain a lot of heat, but you can also dissipate that heat during our hot, humid summers. Um, so when you read the text here a little bit, you can see too that moose, Although they require greater quantities of food on a daily basis, they can actually survive eating lower quality uh, plants and vegetation. And so that's a real big benefit as well uh, to be able to retain that size. So I like to say that they operate at low speed using low octane fuel versus high speed and high octane fuel. So, of course, moose live in areas where there's abundant uh, woody vegetation. And this picture on your right is a, is a really nice picture of moose that are barking, what we call barking a tree. And I'm using my fingers because they use, they don't have any top teeth in the front. They have lower teeth here incisors and two canines on the end. And they rake these trees and strip the bark for the nutrition. Um, but, you know, it's to be a moose, you need to eat a lot of food. You need to be very mobile. Uh, moose are not restricted by snow until you get at least above three feet of snow. So for me to walk through three feet of light fluffy snow, that's, that can be taxing. I need a pair of snowshoes, but a moose um, can do that pretty easily. And uh, that's re really critical when you traditionally have a winter, traditionally, that can last for uh, quite a long time. So of course, this time of year um, is really an interesting change for moose because moose and again just like deer they go into the fall trying to get as fat as they can because they're going to rely on those resources everything they ate during the summer and fall and the fat they got and laid on in that time of year to survive over winter and so they're able to, to use the fat in their body over winter and mobilize that fat um, as they lose weight until spring starts to green up again towards May and the beginning of June. Now moose come out of this period of time right now in April, um, 
where it can be really tough, especially for calves, because they don't go into winter with any fat on them. But, you know, given the situation where their winter ticks and everything, a lot of these moose have lost a lot of body condition and they need something green so they can build back protein and have some good food to eat. And of course, as many of you know, they come out of spring and they're craving salt. And we'll see lots of times in the springtime, they're in these little mud holes along the sides of roads where there are sometimes there's minerals that are naturally a natural salt lick. And in other times, back in the day, there used to be salt or sodium runoff, uh, you know, from putting that on the roads uh, to de-ice places. But moose will seek out these places where there are natural licks and minerals and they crave, crave sodium um, to help them recuperate from the winter time. And they go into bodies of water come June because aquatic and semi-aquatic plants are rich in sodium rich in nutrients and they can get a lot of bulk by feeding in these wet areas. It's really not something that's tied to bugs. People like to think they go in there to avoid bugs, but uh, in the moose woods in June, July, and August, they're plagued by bugs no matter where they go. So moose in Maine in the 1970s, um, you know, we had this little insect come through in north, uh, in the northern part of the <clears throat> New England as well as Eastern Quebec, uh, called the spruce budworm. It defoliated trees. A lot of the large mature spruce and fir uh, came down and had to be salvaged. And this created an unprecedented time where we went from a mature spruce fir forest to now a forest coming up with lots and lots of young growth, including hardwood growth. And it enabled moose in Maine to really recolonize the entire state, push south and west to New Hampshire, Vermont, and now we have moose from Maine all the way down into Connecticut. Um, and that took place from the 70s into the 80s to probably the end of the 90s where we had the high point of moose on the landscape in our state. Today, moose still have a high adult survival rate. Um, they still have abundant food, uh, you know, thank, thanks to our commercial forest industry and the amount of timber that's, uh, that's utilized in the wood product industry. Um, and still today um, with our hunt our 40 years of moose hunting, we still have such a conservative moose hunt that it does not impact whether the moose popula population goes up or down. Um, I apologize, these slides got a little messed up when I changed to a, a wider screen, but you'll have to bear with me. I, I can't change it now, but I, I see we have some errors there. But this slide is telling you that, you know, for, for decades, um, moose and all other species, especially game species, but also non-game, um, have been managed through a very intensive process that involves uh, public uh, consultation and writing management plans and writing assessments of species. And we've done this um, decade after decade. Uh, recently in 2017, we created a new big game management plan for bear, and deer, moose, and turkey. Um, we reached out to the public in all kinds of different formats because of social media and tried to get the viewpoint of all Mainers to understand what uh, people felt about moose. And, you know, one of the things we still maintain and see is that 90% of Mainers still strongly approve of legal moose hunting, which is nice. And there's a pretty good high rating uh, for how we deal with and manage uh, moose themselves. So right now we've had our modern day moose hunt for 40 years. It's been a pretty good success story. Um, you know, big important part of the outdoor heritage um, provides um, high quality moose venison for, for families, 300 pounds of meat for, for uh, quite a while. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very exciting part of uh, how we manage moose. But I was going to go on here and talk a little bit of an overview of moose man management itself and the various things that, that we do as a department to, un, to fully understand the dynamics, the population dynamics of moose. And, you know, I like, to, I like to tell people that if I woke up tomorrow morning and tomorrow was my first day on the job, um, what are the things that I really want to know about moose so I can understand how to manage moose and, and better understand them for all the people in Maine? And those four things here are, I'd want to know something about moose density, how many moose are on the landscape. This left-hand corner picture is a picture I took from a helicopter survey, and these are actually eight 
bull moose running away in a clear cut. So I'd really like to know something about density. On my right, I'd really like to know if I have X number of moose on my left, like a thousand moose, I wanna know how many of those thousand are bulls, how many are cows and how many are calves. I'd like to know something about productivity, how many calves are born every May. And then I wanna know about survival. I wanna know how many of those calves survive their first three weeks of life, how many survive their first year to become a yearling, and then how old do moose uh, get? And I need to know something about the longevity of bulls versus cows. Those are the four cornerstones. Those are the most critical elements um, to understand how moose function on the landscape here in Maine. So of those four, of those cornerstones uh, to help guide management and understand population, um, you know, two of the big things that we've been doing for the last decade is we fly uh, aerial helicopter surveys uh, with our good friends over at the Maine Forest Service. And so, um, you know, one type of the survey is to count moose and to do that in a statistical manner using a mark recapture model. A totally separate survey is a survey where we just uh, go around in the helicopter, just go around, fly around in a helicopter um, to classify a minimum, a minimum of 100 moose so we can figure out the number of bull, cows, and calves. Now, all that sounds simple and it sounds fun and et cetera, et cetera, um, but it's, it's, it's a tremendous, tremendous uh, task to take on. We fly aerial helicopter surveys in the wintertime when there's snow on the ground and after the hunting season. We fly in conditions where the wind speeds are minimal, below 10 miles per hour, um, and, and when it's not snowing or raining. Think about how many days fit that uh, in the state of Maine in, in, in moose country in the wintertime, and you'll see that it's pretty tough. When we do our moose count, um, that takes us an entire day. It's very fatiguing on your mind, focusing on the ground, flying 200 feet above ground, which is just above the treetops, and looking straight down the helicopter, out, you know, alongside the window from the strut out to 200 feet uh, is very uh, mentally uh, and somewhat physically challenging to do that all day, but really good technique for us to be able to figure out how many moose are out, are out there. We also get from these counts, uh, when we look at bulls, cows, and calves, we can figure out productivity. When we count the number of cows and calves in December, um, that gives us a very good idea of what was born in May and survived the summer to make it into their first winter. So that's very important. Um, we also finished last year, for the most part, a long-term seven-year survival study, which I'll talk a little bit more about on adult cows and calves. And one of the side projects of that work was uh, we had a bunch of folks every summer who would spend 12 weeks quietly sneaking in on cows to get a visual to see if the cow had a calf. And there was a rigorous method of doing that. They had to go in and follow up the same cow over and over again and verify a sighting of a calf or verify that the cow did not have a calf. And as you can imagine, trying to sneak up on a cow, uh, even with a radio collar and knowing her location uh, still takes a lot of uh, skill and time and patience to do that. And as I mentioned, we had a seven year study looking at adult cow and calf survival. Um, we're actually continuing to collar calves in January in another unit. And we've uh, put GPS collars on over 675 moose to date and followed those moose over a number of years uh, unless, unless that moose died, where then we'd go in within 24 hours to the dead moose to do a necropsy and figure out what the cause of death was. So a pretty intensive look at adult cow and uh, calf survival. And so, more on that study because it's so critical to everything we know today about um, survival. Um, when we set out in 2014, the winter of 2013 and 14, in partnership with the University of New Hampshire and New Hampshire Fish and Game, um, we went into the study with open minds trying to figure out what would be the rate of death of cows and calves. Um, what that would look like on an annual basis and, uh, and what would be the cause of these mortalities. 
little did we know that um, we knew that winter tick was operating on the landscape and was a problem for moose, but we'd never, until we had these collars on these moose, realized the magnitude of losses uh, from winter tick. And so you can see on the right-hand side here, this is a collared moose and those um, things that are all over the sternum and up into the neck are all engorged adult winter ticks. These are all adult females that are each taking about a mill of blood. And we'll talk more about what they do, but they essentially drain the blood from a moose. And there's so many winter ticks on a moose, and I'll talk more about this later, 50 to 70 to 90,000 ticks that it can quickly lead to the death of a little moose like this. So this project, um, we captured quite a lot of moose over the years in two different study areas. Um, we performed quite a few field necropsies to determine cause of death more than we ever thought we would. We looked at everything um, beyond just the winter tick when we looked at necropsies. We took the moose apart. We sampled everything from uh, the head and brain uh, down to the, the spleen and kidney and all the various organs. Um, took blood samples, established a baseline health assessment, uh, really building a profile of what these moose looked like internally as well as externally to compare over time. And really the findings, you know, highlighted the fact that for our moose calves, um, winter tick was driving their mortality, their death. And in this little pie chart, um, all you need to see here is that out of 320 uh, collared moose here, 83% of those moose and most of them uh, were calves. And what I'm calling a calf is an animal that we capture in January that was born the past May. So we're talking about seven, eight month old animals and they're dying from the winter tick impacts right now during the month of April. So basically I, a month before they return a year old, um, they succumb to uh, the impact of massive infestations of winter tick uh, on their bodies. And so you'll see in this pie chart that yes, we have we had a small percentage that were legally harvested, collared animals that were legally harvested during the fall hunt. Um, and then we had a very small percentage of other things that happened, which are interesting, but it don't amount to a lot. We had a moose that fell off of, and this is no joke, we had a we had an adult cow that fell off of Big Moose Mountain and died from that fall on a very sheer cliff. We actually had two collared moose that died in vehicle collisions, which I think was surprising of all the collared moose we've ever had. We only had two um, that died in a vehicle collision. We had one that drowned in the Aroostook River while trying to cross on the ice. And actually that moose wound up getting uh, taken in the ice flow all the way down from Masardis, Maine, if anybody knows where that is, all the way down to, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought, but um, south of Fort Fear, Fairfield uh, on the St. John, where the rustic dumps in, it was even further down than that. So the moose went tremendously far in an ice flow until it got stoved up as things melted out and we were able to recover that moose. Anyways, interesting things that that happen and, and accidents do happen to wildlife, including, including moose. So another thing that's very interesting about moose in Maine is that, you know, we pride ourselves on the fact that we have a lot of moose, even in the face of winter tick. Um, and we have high densities of moose and people love to see moose. But the reality is when you look at the picture of moose across North American moose range, which is, some of the northern tier states, obviously northern New England, the upper Midwest, Minnesota, Michigan, and then you go out to the Montana region, Utah, Idaho, uh, Montana, and then the west coast of Washington state um, where there's moose. Most moose populations there and in southern Canada, um, there's usually about a moose per square mile. That's a typical number, that's a typical moose density for, for a moose population. Um, as you saw before, moose eat 30 pounds of food a day in the summertime. You can't have a bunch of moose living close together um, because they'd eat themselves out of house and home. So moose typically live in an environment where there's, you know, fairly low densities. In Maine, we've had places that are greater than eight moose per square mile. That's eight times what you would typically see. And in fact, 
Um, even today, we have a few areas that are up in that neck of the woods, uh, north of the Moosehead region. Um, you know, we have other places that are closer to three moose per square mile, but uh, it, those are pretty, pretty impressive numbers. And we get this information from the aerial surveys that we've been conducting for the last 10 years. Um, one of the things that happens with many wildlife species, and this is really something that we've, we've started to see more so with uh, moose and the issue with ticks, is that you know, typically when you have a population of animals that are too dense and the population gets really high, just like I said before, usually food resources start to wane and you lose the food resources quickly and it affects the amount of pregnancies, the amount of young, it affects the health of animals, um, you know, to the point where when there's lower quality food around and they can't get enough food, um, you, you get more sick animals, you get more parasites, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we have that similar situation happening in Maine, except it's not a problem of food, it's a problem of winter tick. And we know that our hunting uh, permit levels are not regulating the moose numbers, not changing them up or down. What is changing the moose population up and down is the survival of calves in their first three weeks of life. And then again, those calves trying to survive to their first year. And what's implicated in that based on our seven years of research is winter ticks and the impact directly on killing calves, but also on depressing reproduction on pregnant cows who are trying to survive on their fat with a pregnancy so they can get through to May and birth a 35 pound calf. Well, when they have 50,000 ticks on their back during March and April, and they're trying to feed a fetus, they're wasting away. They still give birth to a calf in May, but that calf is underweight. We've recovered calves 20 to 25 pounds that are never gonna make it through their first few weeks of life. And so change continues, you know, and one of the things with winter tick, and we'll, we'll talk just a little bit more about this and take, take some questions is that, um, you know, our climate in Maine has started to really change over the last really 20 years, it's really accelerated. And what that means when you talk to the climate people, the, the researchers at Orono, the Climate Council folks, is that our winters have shortened by two weeks. And so we have a longer summer and fall. And what that means is that's the time of year when young winter tick larvae are climbing up on brush and waiting to ambush a moose. And every day it stays warm out there, ticks are getting on moose until the point where we start to get that snowy weather. And that will kill those winter tick larvae. But now with the two weeks extension, every single day, more ticks are getting on more moose to the point where that, that can be lethal uh, to a young moose. And so that's really what's been regulating in the last 10 to 20 years uh, in the state of Maine with climate moderating, winter tick abundance increasing because we've had such a large population of moose uh, as we started the 2000s uh, going into that time period. So just to reiterate, the winter tick is a distinct species of tick. It's not a dog tick. It's not a deer tick. It's a winter tick. It's a unique species. It lives for one year, its life cycle. Deer ticks and dog ticks I don't know about you guys, but at my place, when I walk the dogs right now, every day, I live outside of Bangor, we're getting dog ticks on our uh, dogs every single day. Those, ant those ticks, dog and deer ticks, have to live their life cycle on three different hosts. They gotta get on three different animals and take a blood meal to continue their life cycle. The winter tick doesn't do that. It gets on one animal, spends its entire life cycle on one animal. In this case, it can get on moose, it can get on deer, it can get on snowshoe hare, anything that walks through the woods in the fall, but the moose don't detect that they got all of these ticks. This is a picture right here of my hand, my two hands coupled together on a dead moose, and those are all adult ticks just in that three inch by three inch circle that I've created. Those are all winter ticks, hundreds of them just on that one little spot on a moose. And so, unlike my dogs that pick up three or four or five ticks, which is a lot today, 
a moose can walk through and go by a plant and pick up in one load on one plant, it can pick up a thousand winter ticks on one plant because that's how many eggs are laid by the mother winter tick. And those eggs hatch and they crawl right up the bush. Then that moose is walking through the woods all day long and it's acquiring this massive number of ticks. So pretty ugly. Winter ticks have been around Maine. We can trace it back to the 30s. It was probably here before that. They're not an invasive species. We've always had winter ticks, as far as we can tell, at least, at least we're talking 100 years. Winter ticks range from Texas to Southern Canada. Uh, they're limited by a lot of snow. And um, it's, they're just a, it's just an unbelievable thing. And the reason why they've, they've exploded in the last 20 years is really related to a warming climate and having enough moose on there that don't realize they have these ticks on them. That once those ticks get on the moose in the fall, man, they are, they're psyched because they can live off that moose and they actually breed on the moose in March and April. And then by April and May, the adult females drop off and lay their eggs. And then the females, the adults and the adult females and males die. And then the cycle is perpetuated. It's crazy. So there's a picture in my right hand corner of the actual size of one mil of blood in an, in, in an engorged adult female tick. It's a pretty gruesome thing. Other jurisdictions in the Western United States and in the upper Midwest have had a bad tick year where in the, where in the spring they lose a bunch of calves one year. And then the next year it wanes. They don't see much of an effect. We've, we've only seen consecutive years where winter ticks have been so bad in the Northeast. Um, and in our study area, in our Western unit, six out of the seven years, we lost greater than 50% of our collared calves due to winter tick. And that's, nobody's seen anything like that. That's unprecedented. Why are ticks so bad for moose? Um, well, it's like I already described, they climb up and get on these moose, thousands of them attach, the moose doesn't realize it. They take a blood meal while they're in the larval stage on the moose, really in, in the fall, then they just hang out on the moose. In December, they're, they're at the nymphal stage, they take another blood meal and then they hang out again. And then February and March, they morph into an adult winter tick and they take their final blood meal on this moose. So each one of these ticks to get to this stage of an adult engorged female or a male, they've taken, each one of these ticks has taken three meals off the same animal. And the moose cannot keep up with the blood loss at this point in time, because there's very little protein in the diet. Um, they cannot replenish their blood. They become extremely anemic. And, uh, you know, it's a terrible impact. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, pregnant cows lose body condition um, and produce underweight calves and they have lower reproductive weight, weights, uh, rates, excuse me. And we know that, that as opposed to the 1980s when moose were recolonizing and increasing in Maine, we know that currently our twinning rates are way less than half of what they used to be. Um, and really, really an indication that, that these uh, cows are not producing uh, nearly the number of moose that, that they did decades ago. So what does this mean for the moose population? Well, it, it, it's an interesting thing because in many parts of the state, we've seen some slow declines because we're not gaining moose. We have a high adult survival rates, um, but you know, moose can be resilient. You know, last year, out of the last eight years of our additional study that we've been doing, uh, the winter before this, the moose had a slight reprieve, meaning the winter ticks were there. We lost some moose to winter tick, but we had a little bump up in survival and a little bump up in our calving and the moose came back up a little bit. But the problem is we still have too many moose in those areas causing this high density that just perpetuates um, this winter tick cycle. The other thing is, is when you have consecutive years of winter tick impacting a moose, um, the moose calf that makes it through this next month to its first birthday, then has this summer, June, July, August, and into September to try to gain back a lot of what it's lost. And then it's gonna enter this next winter in a lower plane of health and condition. And then in the winter time, it's gonna be attacked by ticks again. And so it really takes you know, a couple of years 
for these poor moose who are suffering from ticks to be able to recoup um, to get to that point. And with adult females, that means that they breed and successfully calve at a later age. And so what can we do about winter tick? We get suggestions all the time. Um, I try not to lose sleep on this. I think about moose um, every waking moment. I try not to dream about them, um, but that's what I do. You know, I think all about moose. We cannot spray the woods for to kill winter ticks. Uh, most of the land in Maine is privately owned. Spraying uh, pesticides to kill a tick would kill all insect life. It would get in the water resources. It's it's just a non-starter. People always ask us, why don't you put uh, tick collars on moose, just like you do on your dog or something? Well, we're talking about minimally a 400 pound animal. Um, you know, collaring a moose is a dangerous um, thing that we do. We spend a, at least a minimum of a week uh, putting GPS collars on a hundred moose at, at great expense and great resources. Uh, we have to cancel when the weather's bad. Um, you know, 100 tick collars on a moose, even if they worked, wouldn't, wouldn't do anything to change what, what the ticks are doing out there. We can't put pesticides on moose, and we don't even know of any effective treatments. People suggest giving them ivermectin. You know, the problem here with all of these things is that, you know, unlike my dogs that I give a pill to once a month who live in my house and I can control, uh, we can't control moose across 10 million acres of, of forest lands during a time of year, uh, that's pretty harsh. People ask about introducing guinea fowl or, 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 or possums, which have gotten into Southern Maine. And, you know, we're, we're, not in, we're not in the, it's not a practical thing to introduce an exotic animal like a guinea fowl that's native to warm climates, that's gonna die uh, and not be able to survive a Maine winter. As it is, we have uh, native birds like the Canada Jay, or, call, or the whiskey jack, or the gray jay, whatever you want to call it, um, gorby, mainers call it, um, that eat ticks right off moose, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't do anything, it's not enough. So there's no practical way to kill ticks over a large animal, this large area, excuse me, the size of a ma management district. And uh, really we want to try to figure something out, out to break the winter tick cycle so we can improve the health of moose by increasing their productivity how many calves are born and by decreasing the amount of these calves that die from uh, winter tick impacts during the springtime. And so we've proposed to put in a, an experimental uh, increase in the cow hunt in a very small portion of one of our management units. Um, and it's one of those things that's been very counterintuitive to people because, you know, people equate sometimes equate any level of hunting with declines. As I mentioned, our hunting has been so conservative that it doesn't change or impact the population levels. And that's just, that's just a fact. That's the way it is. Um, we want to take a small portion, half of one management district, a thousand square miles, increase the cow permits in there to drop the population down to a level that could potentially break the winter tick cycle. Because we know that moose at lower population densities tend to be more free of parasites, not just winter ticks, but multiple internal parasites that our moose uh, currently have. And, and you know, despite the rampage of winter tick in many of these areas, uh, we still have um, you know, fairly high densities, like I said, relative to other North American moose populations in these areas. Um, you know, we realize that the public is very concerned about increasing cow permits. That's why we're doing this at a very small level. It's actually 6% of the entire core range. Um, but, you know, our work is based in science and good science and rigorous science that we've been working on, not only for seven years, uh, you know, demonstrating the impacts of winter tick on moose, but longer than that uh, with doing aerial survey work and all of the other data that we collect in support of our moose management system and research. So the so-called adaptive unit to try to see if we can do something about these ticks, again, is up in Management District 4, which is up in the, up in the upper St. John uh, Valley um, in the western part of Maine along the Quebec border. And we'd like to slowly decrease uh, the population density over time. Again, it's in a small, small area, but it's about a thousand square miles, which we hope is big enough to be able to demonstrate and show and measure 
um, whether this reduction would help uh, break this tick cycle. And so this is really kind of demonstrating things. Here's a blown up picture I showed you before where you can really see uh, both male and female adult winter ticks. Um, a lot of males feeding on this, this moose right here. Um, but you know, the adaptive unit is something where we, 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 we use that phrase because it's something that on every year we're able to, we're gonna be able to look and see how far we've gone. We're gonna be able to measure the impact we're gonna be measuring the winter tick loads. We're gonna be counting moose. We're gonna be looking at bull cow calf ratios. We're gonna be looking at reproduction. And whatever happens up down, um, it's gonna be a tool to be able to demonstrate whether this would benefit moose or not. Um, again, this district is up here to the north and west of Baxter State Park. Um, it's within our core range. It was strategically chosen as an adaptive unit because it's impacted by ticks. In fact, last year we had collared calves in District 4 and we lost 38% uh, of those moose. And as of today, we have now lost this, this year in the second cycle of putting collars on these calves. Um, as of this week, we've lost 58% of those collared calves uh, due to winter tick uh, in that area. We know we have lower calf production up there. Um, it's, it represents really, you know, what moose habitat looks like, looks like in the core range. And uh, it's, it's a really valuable scientific tool to put the adaptive unit in that specific area. So in the meantime, uh, again, last year, in order to monitor and measure what's going on in that unit, last year we collared um, 60 calves across the unit. This year we collared an additional 70 calves and follow them to see whether they uh, live or not. Um, we continue to collect information at harvest on moose, including looking at their two teeth, so we can look at the male and female age distributions. Um, we count winter ticks on the back of the moose that are harvested in the fall, and we're gonna continue to do our aerial surveys uh, to count the moose as I, as I previously mentioned, excuse me. So a lot of things that are still going on. The outcome of this, uh, this adaptive unit will be that either the, that the increased harvest does not affect ticks or lower calf mortality. That may be an outcome. And we won't know until um, you know, several years, five years into, uh, into doing this work. Um, we're hoping that the opposite is true, that increasing the harvest will reduce the number of ticks on these moose and it'll increase uh, moose reproduction and also increase the survival of these calf moose. Either way this goes, uh, we will measure that progress on an annual basis. We will know what's going on. And when we come out the other end, we'll have a management tool to help guide the future uh, of our moose uh, management. So just to recap uh, some of the things I said today, um, you know, moose really recolonized Maine in the 70s and got to a high point in the late 90s. It, it's been a, it's been a great great thing for the state and you know moose have been very visible unfortunately we grew moose to a point that they were too much for their own good because little did anybody realize over over decades is that you know climate has been changing to the tune of you know already we're, we've lost two weeks of winter and anybody who looks out the window this this spring it's incredibly dry even in the most northerly part of maine um you know spring came weeks and weeks and weeks early. I mean, it's just unbelievable to see uh, what we've seen this year. Um, but winter tick has plagued, you know, us for a number of years now. And, and again, our study demonstrated six out of seven years really were, were pretty bad. There's no feasible solution to treat moose, um, you know, by spraying the woods or putting stuff on moose. And really our adaptive uh, hunt we would suggest is, is the best scientific approach to see if we can do something uh, to remedy winter tick. So, you know, I appreciate everybody listening. And uh, again, I'd be happy to uh, take some questions about moose that we might have. Yeah, that was great, Lee. Thank you again. Um, it is always wonderful to have you on and um, feel like I pick up more information every time and I hope others are as well. So thank you. Um, the chat has been pretty active and so we do have a handful of questions that um, we'll ask you. So again, if you do have any questions, make sure you write them in the chat. 
and we'll try to get to them before we finish tonight. Um, but if you have a question afterwards, you can always message us um, later through our website or on social media and we'll, uh, we'll get hopefully get an answer for you soon. All right, so to start off, um, we'll, we'll start here with a winter tick question. And someone wants to know, does the tick load on a bull moose um, come spring time affect his impending antler growth? Wow, that's a, that's a really, really great question because antler growth is tied in to the health of the bull itself. Um, there's a genetic component to antler growth. Um, and, you know, I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would surmise that based on looking at moose antler spreads in the harvest every year, um, you know, I don't see any real changes in that. So, you know, trying to follow this through if that if winter ticks were impacting the physical condition of bulls to the extent that it was affecting their antler growth, um, maybe that would show up in the fall. The thing is, is that antler growth for moose um, is really gonna be starting up really very soon. If not already, it starts pretty quick. Now that starts to coincide with spring green up, not for another you know, month or so. I was surprised, I was out in the moose woods on Monday um, up in the Moosehead region. And I was surprised to find green vegetation. Um, um, trilliums were coming up, which was really interesting, but I was surprised honestly to see some green. And, and obviously a moose is able to focus in on any area in the woods where something green that they would eat would come up and start to build some protein and some nutrients back in their body in time for growth. Now, now antler growth in a big bull can be you know, up to three quarters of an inch in a day. It's one of the fastest growing uh, natural tissues that we know in the animal planet, let's just say. And so, I, you know, I also wonder if once green up comes, um, there's an acceleration of that growth because the living gets a lot better. That was a long-winded answer to that. No, that's good. It's always nice to get this, uh, this other uh, different information up. So thank you. Um, another question is, uh, so do deer get just as impacted from winter ticks as the moose? They do not. And somebody, somebody had asked me this recently, which is, it, it was, it was a little confusing for people when they realized that, you know, moose get these huge amounts of winter tick on them, but any, any animal going through the woods is going to be impacted. What happens is that the, the winter tick eggs are lying dormant on the ground and then they burst open based on, we think it's temperature and humidity related. And then all the little larvae crawl out, which are probably smaller than the point of a pencil. And they crawl in mass up the nearest shrub. And then they're waiting for something to come by and they sense the, the carbon dioxide coming off of your body. So if I was walking through the moose woods at the right time and brushed a tree, because the ticks have interlocking arms, they're all like one big pod. As soon as one contacts me, they all go with it. And that's why these moose are acquiring hundreds at a time. What's happening with deer, we believe is that it's an evolutionary deal. So deer, white-tailed deer have been in the United States longer than moose have. And as generations and generations react to different changes in their world, um, the idea is that moose are, are newer to this part of the world and aren't reacting to the acquisition of the winter tick larvae on their bodies. So the deer is grooming itself using its tongue, using its teeth. They like to use their rear hooves to scratch and then they can use trees. So we will once in a while in the winter time, we will find some deer with very small loads of winter tick, meaning you know, maybe they have 10, 20 or more on them. You comb through a, a, a moose and Again, it's in the tens of thousands of ticks. And moose are able to get ticks off them, winter tick off them, but, it, but it's not till the nymphal stage in December where the moose start to notice this and really trying to get it off. That's why if you spend time in the moose woods right now, you're gonna see moose that have prematurely lost their hair uh, due to rubbing and scratching from winter tick. 
that's not their new coat that's coming in. Uh, that won't be coming in until the end of end of May, the new coat. And it comes in in a different molt pattern than the pattern of hair loss, premature hair loss from winter ticks. Wow, definitely makes you happy to not be a moose with winter tick. That does not sound very fun well, to be a moose with that. <laughs> well, and Laura, and truly, it, it truly drives them crazy because the amount of ticks on a moose, and you can see this in some photos, it's like your skin is crawling. And instead of spending time um, foraging for food, um, you know, re, you know, um, masticating, I, I'm, I'm losing the word for it, you know, re, you know, working on their food, chewing their cud, bedding down, instead of doing that, they're completely distracted and they're, and they're spending a much larger percentage of their day trying to get rid of these ticks. And some of them succeed to the point where they've rubbed off all their hair to the point where they start to get abrasions and they'll get secondary infections and they can sprout, they can get serious bacterial infections. And that's, that can be pretty gruesome too. Wow. So somebody wanted to know, are winter ticks more prevalent in certain um, moose populations in Maine? And is there evidence of moose dispersal being correlated with the increases in winter ticks? So how's it affecting the like how how is it affecting where the where the moose might be moving and do winter tick affect certain moose populations more than others? So the, so we've been working with some fellow researchers, postdoctoral student at University of New Hampshire, and what we're seeing is that the heavy tick burdens, the heavy tick areas, are a band of latitude. So unfortunately. Northern Vermont, Northern New Hampshire, and that part that stretches all the way across Maine is the worst case scenario for having, having had or have a lot of moose and climate that has moderated enough to extend the summer fall to make those tick populations in abundance, abundance excuse me, explode to the levels they're at. So for instance, our management unit eight, where six out of seven years, we had the worst calf mortality. That's the Jackman, uh, Moose River, uh, Greenville area, extending over to Flagstaff Lake. That area has been hit the hardest. Our other study area for five years was in Northern Maine District two, which is west of Route 11, west of Portage, west of Ashland, north of the Reality Road to the New Brunswick border, all the way to the Allagash Waterway to the west. That has less of an issue and we've lost, or, or I should say survival has been double that. The calves survival rate has been double what we've seen in our Western unit. So out of the five years of our research up there, we did seven years in the Western unit and overlapped five in the Northern. We had one year in the Northern unit where our mortality of collared moose was greater than 50%. Now the answer about dispersal is that the big time for moose to disperse and not all of them do this. Moose have a home range in our state based on hundreds of GPS collared moose uh, of about 10 to 12 square miles. That doesn't necessarily mean their range looks exactly like a square. It may be very elongated depending on the habitat types. Very few of these moose take long distance dispersal movements to go someplace else. Now, that being said, there are some yearlings and some two-year-olds, bulls and cows that decide to go on, what do the Australians call it? They, they, they go on an outback walk, there's, there's a name for it. But uh, walkabout, I think. Walkabout. We've had, we had a cow moose that was caught up in the Fish River Lake country, if people know that. She went all the way south to Millinocket went to the Appala over the Appalachian Trail to Moosehead Lake, decided to come back over the Appalachian Trail, and then went all the way west around Moosehead Lake again, headed up north around Chisuncook and went right back to Fish River Lake. Um, and she did that all just for the summer and decided that the grass was just as green in her home range. Um, we have other moose that have gone to Quebec. Uh, we've had a couple of moose, not many, go to New Brunswick. And of course they have to, in, in most of the areas where our moose were, they would have to cross the St. John River. And maybe that's too much of an impediment, but moose are great swimmers. But they're dispersing at a time where the moose is free of ticks, 
Okay, so when the moose shed their coats, their winter coat by the end of May and molt and they get their new summer coat up, all of the winter ticks are gone with the final shedding of the coat and they are free of winter tick during the summer. People say to me all the time, I saw ticks on moose during the summer. What people are seeing is the moose fly, which is a moose specific fly. It looks just like a house fly. And if you're paddling, and I hope you all get out paddling this summer on main waterways and you see a moose with things all over it that jump, that go off and on when the moose moves, that is a horde of moose flies, which cause abrasions on the rear legs of these moose. But that's just something moose deal with. They don't care. Well, I don't know. I've never talked to a moose. But... <laughs> right. But they, they live with it. They deal with it. Same way we probably deal with our own pests like mosquitoes. <laughs> like black flies. Yeah. All right. To follow up with that, there was just a couple other questions. So do you think that um, the moose then could be moving north um, or south to escape uh, winter ticks? Well, not, not, not in a conscious, conscious way. I mean, and, and what we see again from caller data is that, you know, just like the moose expanding in the seventies and eighties, you know, the expansion of moose is like, it's like blowing, it's like blowing a bubble over a long, over a number of years. It takes, they got to push out on their, on their edges. And yes, there may be the moose that goes and has some wanderlust and takes up um, a home range someplace else. We've had five moose that were collared in the state of New Hampshire leave northern New Hampshire and wander down to the greater Portland area only to get hit by cars, which is really strange when you think of it because their cues as to where they're going, some of that's driven by, you know, bumping into something major, right? Like uh, a highway maybe, although that doesn't prevent a moose from crossing um, or a major waterway or something. And maybe that changes the direction of that moose. It's really difficult uh, a question to answer, but I don't think that a moose suffering from winter tick and making it, you know, through into May and June is thinking um, that they're going to disperse to another area where they may be tick free, um, you know, unless that's happenstance and, and, and happens evolutionary over time. So, you know, it's difficult to say. I think you just hit the follow-up question that they just typed. They were just wondering if the populations are moving gradually north or south. Um, and so you said perhaps, so do you think perhaps that could be an evolutionary thing they might do? Do you think they might naturally move with the changing climate or with the tick issue? Well, I mean, not to sound, um, I mean, the bottom line with moose is that, and you know, most wildlife species are this way, which is they're dependent on the food resource. And, and for moose, they need to have areas that are regenerating where new plants are growing, new woody plants, um, and they need tons of that. So for instance, you know, no offense to our friends in New York State and the Adirondacks, but the Adirondacks are a place where they've had, they have uh, 6 million acres of reserve lands, the Adirondack Park, that's forever wild, and I'm not making any kind of uh, value judgments on that. And they have a bunch of private inholdings where, uh, where those are the only places where they can cut wood. Those are the places where their moose are and their moose are not growing and their moose are not growing as a population because you need to cut a lot of trees. And if you fly over the state of Maine, especially north of Baxter and in the, in the commercial private forest lands, you will see what moose habitat looks like. And that's why we have moose. And when that disappears, if we woke up tomorrow and the entire North country of commercial forest lands were all mature trees again, um, you would not see moose because then they would rely on natural phenomenon like fire, which is typically suppressed. Again, I'm not making value judgments um, or natural wind throw, hurricanes, storms to open up an area. All deer and all moose rely on sunlight penetrating the forest floor for plants to grow. And in the case of a moose, when you weigh whether you're a 400 pound calf, an 800 pound cow, or a 1200 pound bull, you have to eat every day and you need to eat a lot. No, well, I mean, that's that's great information. And uh, speaking of uh, moose eating, we know when they, they eat, they're getting bigger. So someone would like to know, um, what is the meat quality like in a moose that is harvested that has had a lot, has had a lot of winter tick? Um, and this is in regards to the zone four hunt. 
Well, I mean, most moose are impacted in the state of Maine by a variety of parasites. If I was to look at a moose in any part of Maine at any point in time, I probably could find some type of parasite. It's, 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 is that natural? You know, I don't know. Our moose carry lungworm, they carry muscle tapeworm, they carry a kind of con, a kind of which is another tapeworm, excuse me. <clears throat> and then the ectoparasite winter tick. Again, when spring finally hits and, and May and June come, moose are in a hyper eating stage, so to speak, okay, where nutrient where where food is at its its high point for nutrients, <clears throat> it's at its most diverse point, and they're hell bent for leather, for lack of a better term, to feed all their way until tr uh, plant life senesces again in the fall. And that, of course, coincides with typical harvest time, whether that's harvesting people's vegetables or harvesting a moose. And so they're really in their prime condition. And so what I'm saying to the answer to this question is that of all the moose I look at, and I look at a lot of moose every year in the harvest, it's an extreme event to find a moose in poor condition or in condition that you could you could look at, feel the musculature, or look at other signs like the hair coat, some deformations with the antlers, something that's not right that would speak to the health of that individual moose. And uh, I've seen a lot of moose, uh, alive moose, as well as dead moose. I know my way around the inside of moose uh, pretty good. And, um, you know, we're fortunate because, again, Maine has a very rich hunting tradition. And, you know, it can mean a lot to people to harvest an animal like that and provide some high quality meat for, uh, for people, some high quality organic meat. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Well, that's definitely all, all good information, especially since there's a, still a couple of weeks left to enter in for your chance for the moose permit in the lottery, which so is about a couple of weeks left till that closes. Um, so another uh, question was, you, you mentioned about doing uh, moose population studies and someone was wondering, um, how do you determine uh, when you're doing a moose study, uh, where, what areas to choose? Now you're talking about just flying aerial surveys? I think just in general, they were just wondering how you choose different areas to study, you know, whether it's doing your aerial surveys or, or you know, if you're picking, you know, maybe, maybe what, like why you chose zone four, things like that. Like what, what, what yeah. characteristics do you use? Okay. Well, first of all, um, back in 2012, we, we basically said that if you look at, if you look at Maine from a line, let's just, and this is not to offend anybody's homes or, or where they live, but really the bulk of moose country is, is the commercial forest land. So if I drew a line from, let's just say someplace in Bethel, all the way across to like Grand Lake Stream, the whole Northern part of the state is going to drive our total moose population, right? So for me to conduct an aerial survey in a helicopter, I'm not gonna fly and I'm not trying to be, sound like a jerk or, or be cavalier in saying this, but I'm not gonna fly down in Kennebunk um, or I'm not going to fly the Bangor area to count moose because it'd be a waste of time. Uh, there's moose that live in the southern part of the state uh, in coastal parts, but it's nothing like the magnitude. So first cut is you have to look at, you know, where are, where is the core range? And that's that whole area. And that's about 16,000 square miles. Now in those areas, as far as flying aerial surveys, the western two areas, zone seven and eight, we can't fly transects a straight line to count moose, which is our technique, because when you um, approach a really steep mountain with four people and fuel on board, you can't get up and over the mountain safely. And at the elevation that we have to maintain, which is 200 feet above ground at all times, you can't maintain that. So that takes away a little bit from that. We, we fly and count moose in 10 of our 12 management units that comprise the entire core range. Now those units that we can't do the moose counts in, we do fly in to classify the number of bulls, cows, and calves. And we just did that this winter over in that Rangeley area where we classified moose, which also gives us a very good index of how many moose are in that area. If you're spinning around in a helicopter over and over again and flying 150 feet above ground and you're not seeing moose, that tells you something. But where we're flying, um, we're, we're counting moose left and right. Now, when we start our adult survival study, 
in 2014 and we could pick anywhere. Um, we wanted to pick an area where um, there was moose hunting, there was moose viewing, um, there were concerns, but something that represented from a habitat standpoint, um, a greater area. And District 8 in Western Maine and that Greenville Moose River Jackman area um, was a really, really good place to look at adult cow and calf survival. We also knew based on loggers and foresters and guides and our wardens and biologists, we knew that there were some springs where people were finding a bunch of dead moose in the woods. And a bunch of dead uh, moose doesn't tell a story. So that's why you have to call her these moose and follow them so that you, you can statistically know what's going on out there. And then we, we, we chose a study area up in District 2 to continue for five years because it's as far north as we could get latitudinally. And we knew there may be something significant with climate affecting winter tick moose dynamics. And that's as far north as we could go. Now District 4 for the adaptive unit was selected because as I mentioned in the talk, it's a 2000 square mile area on the border of Quebec. Um, actually the commercial landowners and the Nature Conservancy, which owns the Upper St. John watershed up there are concerned about the number of moose and the impacts to the forest, uh, you know, from the amount of browsing on regenerating plants. So we, we have a lot of support from the large landowners to reduce the moose. It's also an area that is readily divided into two so that we can compare the one side where we intensify harvest to the other side where the harvest remains status quo. It's an area where we know it's impacted by ticks. Again, I've lost 58% of my collared calves as of today in that area. So I've lost 40, 40 calves out of 69 collared calves that I had in January. I've lost a winter tick. So we know it's impacted by winter tick as lower reproduction. And it represents uh, what, what moose habitat, intensive moose habitat looks like in the state. So it's a, it's a really good area. Um, I've heard other people say other reasons, but that's hearing it from the horse's mouth, um, that it's, it's a scientifically driven um, methodology and the way we, we do these things. Uh, that's a lot of really great information. You definitely uh, have to really understand the moose and what information you're you're looking for to determine um, what kind of where you'll focus your efforts. So that's really great. Um, someone did have a, a question about um, about the winter ticks. So uh, they they had skipped putting in to for the hunt in fear of shooting um, a moose and finding it loading loaded with thousands of ticks. Um, will there be an abundance of ticks on moose during the hunting season? And is that something that they should be concerned with? That's a great question. So um, moose are acquiring the larval, the little tiny larval winter ticks from September into November or until we actually get snow that stays for several days. Um, at that stage, the little larvae, when a moose is harvested, they're trying to get away from the carcass of that moose as it cools down. Um, it has no impact on that moose at that stage in the fall, it hasn't. It has unlikely even taken a blood meal. Now some of those larvae might, but the larvae is so tiny at that point that even with thousands of ticks, let's say, let's say a moose acquired thousands, it's not impactful in the fall. Okay, and moose are still feeding and and doing well. Um, and those ticks are trying to get away once that moose carcass cools down. But the other important thing here is to make sure that everybody realizes that the winter tick, to our knowledge, and we've had tested working with the Vector Borne Disease Lab, the winter tick does not carry the same type of human diseases that are associated with the deer tick, okay? And they're different ticks. So everybody needs to be cognizant of the deer tick where they live and be absolutely vigilant about having deer ticks on them because of carrying Lyme disease and anaplasmosis, which are the worst ones, as well as Powassan virus. Um, but to our knowledge, other ticks, including the dog tick uh, and the winter tick do not are not carriers of these disease. So once in a while in the fall, we'll have bird hunters who are in the moose woods uh, call us up and say that they got all these little mites all over them, which they're really talking about the winter tick larvae. 
Um, and some will get maybe a slight, potentially a slight rash from having those ticks on them, um, but, but they're not known to uh, harm people. So I would not let uh, winter tick larvae um, be worrisome in any shape or form for the fall hunt. Yeah, that's, that's great information. It's always good to be informed before you get out there and, uh, and go for your hunt. So thank you for that question. Um, we're gonna get just a few more questions and then, uh, and then we're gonna be calling it a night and just really wanna thank everybody for, for, for sticking with us and uh, submitting these really great questions. So um, one of our last few questions is gonna be, is there an ideal ratio for bull to cow? Well, that's a great question. I mean, there's actually been a lot of research done on that actually in Quebec. And, and what the question is really about is um, in a natural system, there's, there's gotta be different rates of mortality between bulls and cows. And people like to look at that when it comes to other species like deer and things like that. But you know, most moose managers and the way that we used to manage moose during the last um, species planning period was we were trying to maintain 60 bulls for every 100 cows. And the rationale behind some level of bull cow ratios is all about breeding behavior um, to ensure that there's enough bulls around to breed females, but not only that, but the age distribution. So you want enough mature bulls to pass on their genes um, to cows. And so our um, adult sex ratios, which is something that we get from actually getting eyes on moose in the helicopter. So one of the things we do in our count is we're able to enumerate and count the bull to cow ratio and the calf to cow ratio. And what's amazing is that um, in many of our districts, um, we have bull to cow ratios that are far above 60 uh, cows per 100. In fact, the recent flight I did in District 7 in the Rangeley area was basically the bull and cows were on par, meaning you know, I believe the ratio was 98 bulls per 100 cows. So it's basically one to one, which is amazing because you know people can say what they want, but we have a, we have a bull hunt only in District 7. It's 125 permits across a thousand square miles. It, it doesn't, it's not impactful to the population. That's demonstrated in the data. Um, so anyways, we try um, and, and still with our new management system in place, that's really still where we, where we try to be because we also realize that people wanna see mature bulls out there. And the interesting thing about the Maine moose hunt, 40 years later, is that most hunters who have a bull permit avoid and do not shoot yearling moose with spikes. Now that inadvertently, not on purpose, that inadvertently protects, so to speak, that age class so that it moves on to the two-year-old age class. And that has a ripple effect, effect down that age distribution of moose. So, you know, the most common age moose that is harvested for 40 years has not changed. The, the average age bull has not changed despite any of it. Um, and so you, you know, as moose, bull moose get older, they certainly get a lot smarter. Moose are one of the smartest animals out there. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, and as they get older, uh, they become even more wily. And the fact is, is that, you know, Maine moose woods are highly, highly roaded. There's lots and lots of roads. Moose have lots of avenues to escape and, and our hunting permit levels are very conservative. So anyways, um, one last thing about that is bull to cow ratios can be, can be as low as 20 bulls per 100 cows and still have an effective breeding strategy. People need to understand that the Eastern moose uh, functions like a white-tailed deer. Well, that's an insult. Let me take that back. The Eastern moose, because it lives in a forested area, is what's called a cereal breeder, meaning a bull moose wants to breed as many cows as she can. The bull moose in Alaska, who lives and functions in a more open area, keeps a harem of cows that he can keep his eyes on. And when another big bull comes to challenge, he can protect his harem. So he only breeds those cows. It's a different system in the thick woods of the Northeast. Wow, that's, that's some really good information. And that seems to be a theme with our, our last questions. People have some questions about bull moose here, their antlers. 
Um, yeah. Somebody is wondering, what is the biggest bull moose you have seen in the last few few years? And then also, what is the widest antler spread um, that you can recall? So there's big as far as weight, and then there's big as far as spread. And the, the subspecies of moose, the Eastern moose is a different subspecies than the Alaskan moose. And there's also a Shearer's moose, which lives in uh, the, the Wyoming, Utah, uh, Idaho area, which is the smallest of the four subspecies. There's also the Canadian or Canada moose subspecies as well, um, or Northwestern. And then there's an intergrade someplace in Ontario where they all, they're all Eastern moose. Anyways, when a, when a bull moose gets a, a spread of 50 inches, that's, that's a pretty good spread. Now, we typically get moose with spreads that exceed 60 inches. The thing is, is that the spread and beauty of a bull moose's antlers, whether they're uniform on both sides or not, can, can, can really affect the spread of that moose. So as those antlers, the real wide spreads have a lot of antler beam that comes out like this and then goes into the palm as opposed to the palm coming out right here. Um, we've had um, bull moose with spreads up to 70 inches. Um, not all moose with large spreads are verified, um, you know, by like the Antler and Skull Trophy folks or Boone and Crockett. But we get that data every year when we're measuring those antlers. And some of them, when they get really large, I've called up people to find out to gain an accuracy. So I would go with 70 inches as a max. Um, and that does happen. And they tend to be these interesting, really wide flattening out antlers. Um, the biggest bull that was ever harvested, interestingly enough, from a weight point was in, in Masardis in 1982, and it came out in pieces. Um, and it was, it was weighed at over 1300 pounds um, in pieces, dressed out. Okay, that was not a live weight. That was the waterman bull that was shot and there's nothing that's ever come close and it's very very interesting because blood volume and and the entrails and heart and everything can make up up to 30 percent of the body weight um, it's a tremendous amount of weight that's inside there now we've had a number of 1200 pound moose that have come out of the woods typically a big moose that comes out during september is over a thousand pounds and we have multiple thousand pound moose that are harvested every year now between the September hunt, which falls on one of the last weeks of September, just between that, when two weeks pass and the October hunt comes, those moose, bull moose, same bull moose have already lost 8% of their body weight because of their running around trying to defend the cow they're with at, their t at that time from another moose. So they actually stop feeding um, for maybe up to two weeks. Um, so that's, that's a big bull moose, but it's very different between September and October. Um, but of course the, the spread of those antlers have maxed out, uh, once those antlers harden, once the velvets rubbed off for that, for that particular year and a bull, a bull will keep growing its antlers in size and beauty until about 11 years old. And then it enters a stage of sen senescence where it can still gain circumference here. Um, but it's not going to gain more points or other form. And sometimes those beams can actually start to bend and change in formation pretty cool uh, that is that is some really um great information and um really want to thank you again lee for um for joining us um tonight um there's been a lot of really great information oh we have something here to to see and so that's that's right that's why we all love these moves right just a beautiful Beautiful big antler there. Got to got to do a show and tell at the at the eight twenty hour. No, that's really that's really interesting to see and real and really fascinating. I mean, one of the things people just really enjoy is is kind of seeing about about the moose and their antlers. Whether you're a hunter or you like to just view view moose, the antlers are always probably one of the most fascinating things about about, about them. So thank you. That's that's a really really nice example. 
Um, so thank you again, Lee, and thank you everybody for joining us. We hope that you um, learned some great more information about our moose here in Maine and the management of them um, in regards to winter tick and overall. So thank you again, Lee, um, really appreciate it. Yep, thank you. And I just want to remind everybody that we do have some more upcoming presentations starting um, this Friday at 9.30 a.m. We have a coffee with MDIFW and Commissioner Camusa will be joining us again this Friday, April 30th at 9.30 uh, for a spring check-in. So we hope you will join us then. So take care, everybody. Thank you.